want to share something with you that I feel like is life-changing this morning. I, I feel like it will uh, penetrate into your thinking, change your mindset. And I believe that I've really come to a strong opinion of that, that the kingdom is a mindset shift away. Us manifesting kingdom life. The kingdom life is just a mindset shift away. And um, I'm not talking about just changing what you think, but how you think. That's what I'm really talking about. And so I, I feel like the Lord has been doing this work in me. It's exciting what he's doing in me. I'm excited about it. I'm still searching my way through some of it. Some of it I have. And some of it I have it so good I'm wondering what in the world took me so long to get it. Um, look at John 3.17. I'm just going to read. Well, actually, why don't you just uh, do yourself a favor and turn to Romans 8. And I'll quote John 3.17 to you. Just one verse. John 3.17. Matter of fact, who can quote it? Who, who for God did not condemn it? the world. For God did not send. For God right sent track. not His Jesus Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Okay, that's yeah. John three seventeen. John three sixteen is a powerful verse. But John 3, 17 has to be tied in with it. <laughs> Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And there's a lot, a lot of religious folks preach John 3, 16. But only the fanatical grace folks will preach John 3, 17. The verse that follows right after that says God did not send the, his son into the world to condemn the world. Okay. But that through him the world might be saved. So I want to get into that this morning for a little bit. I'll let Stacy do some reading. Uh, Romans chapter 8. And uh, this is the uh, New American Standard Bible version. So follow along in whatever version you have there. But this is the New American Standard version. And then I'll, I'll stop you after the very first verse. Just for an insert there. But then uh, I'll let you read for a little bit. So go ahead. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, in the NASB and the NIV and in a handful of versions, they've dropped the phrase off that you might be seeing in your King James or New King James Bible, uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. How many of you have that in your Bible? Okay, uh, it's, in, it's in the King James, which was the one that we all thought was the most anointed for a long time. Um, and it really has nothing to do with that. But there's, there's there are lots of different translations Basically, the train, we're going to get into this next Saturday. I forgot to announce that. Yeah. Next Saturday, how to study the Bible. Ooh, how to yeah. study the Bible, 530 next Saturday. I'm really excited about that. And I know that a lot of you are because you're talking with me about well, I want to get into that. I want to show you that there were lots of different groups that translated the Word of God from, from the original languages over into English, you know, to Latin originally and into English. And, but we want to talk about that. And I don't want to, my purpose is not to put doubt in you to where you're concerned about whether you're reading the right Bible or not, because I trust the Holy Spirit enough to speak to you from that Bible. But then there, I just want to take just a few things that are major that I think over the years were added in by translators or left out by translators and highlight some of that just to help you see the need to know how to study your Bible. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's important. I think it's important that we not just be content to just come to church and listen to what someone else thinks about the Word right. of God. In fact, I, I give you the right to disagree with me this morning. All right? You have that right. You can go anytime I ever preach. Feel free to study and, and, and find whether or not what I'm saying is accurate and right and true. And if you think you find where I'm in error, come to me and let's sit down and open our Bibles together and go over it together. Because I'm willing to listen to you, but if you're wrong, you have to be willing to listen to me as well. Okay? It's, so it's, that's a fair trade, I think. All right? And I'm a very gentle, peaceable guy, so we can talk and not get heated. Amen? We can disagree and still hug and shake hands and, and wish you all the best when you walk out the door. All right. So, uh, but that's what this class is going to be about is how to study. So now I'm not going to tell you whether I think the, that it should or shouldn't be in there because I really don't know at this point. But there were a lot of translators that felt like that was not in the original writings, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. They felt like verse 1 of Romans 8 sounded too easy and too good to be true, the way that it was originally written. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And so they felt like the original translators added that phrase in there to put a little bit more effort into it. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So I, I don't, I'm not sure yet. I'm just telling you right now. I'm not 100% certain, but I know that that is a, an opinion of a lot of good, well-grounded preachers and theologians that that was not in the original writings, okay? So if I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, it's not in there. So that's, that's why, okay? Stacey, pick back up with verse 2 now. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, now there's the phrase again that's been added back in again there. But listen, let me talk about what she's talking about for just a minute there. Go back up at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. Let me just ask you this morning. What do you think the law of sin and death is? I mean, if I just threw that out there and asked you, what do you think? What comes to mind? What is the law of sin and death? The law of Moses. And we know that that's what it's talking about because it goes on to confirm that in the very next verse. Now, a lot of people, when we think, we, we used to read that and we used to think this law of sin and death was just the power that sin had and the power that death had over us and the sway that and the influence that it had over humanity. But listen, what do you think it was that empowered sin and death over humanity? It was the law the law of Moses. That's what empowered it, okay? And Paul confirms that in multiple places, but one, in fact, he says the strength of sin is the law. That's what he said, okay? All right, so I, there's a method to this. I want to take you someplace this morning that I believe is going to be very liberating for you. Then it went on to say, for, and it tells us what law is talking about, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Can you say amen to that? God did. Because the law couldn't, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. I mean, are you seeing that? He's straight, now, now we understand what the Old Testament prophecies were talking about, where he looked and couldn't find anyone, and the Bible said he stretched out his own right arm. He literally sent his son, which was his own right arm, into the earth to become, to take on the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering. Now, now, flesh, by and in, of, in and of itself, is sinful, okay? It was just because of the craving. Uh, let me just put it this way. We've talked about this a little before. If, if you take your spirit out of the equation, you're in trouble because your flesh will eat anything it wants, will lay around and sleep all the time. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. By nature, the flesh just wants to do, it's just selfish. Yeah. That's what it is. It wants what it wants, when it wants it. And sometimes it wants who it wants. Amen. When it wants it, the flesh is just selfish by nature, okay? So when you take the spirit away, the flesh is in a world of trouble. Jesus even said the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. weak. The flesh is weak, okay? So he took on weak flesh, Jesus did. He was the son of God, but when he came to earth, he became the son of man. He took on the same weak flesh that you and I are composed of. The house that we live in, he lived in as well. And that means that he was tempted just like us, felt just like us, had the same cravings that we had, the same temptations and desires that come against you and I came against him as well right. when he was on earth. And Hebrews tells us that it did. It, that's what made him such a perfect high priest. Okay, so it was weak. He took that on uh, sinful flesh as an offering for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. <laughs> Amen. So he didn't just fulfill it himself, but he fulfilled it in us. He gave us the means to fulfill it by the new law that he introduced into the earth, which was the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So when we're in Christ, the law has been fulfilled in us as well. Amen. 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 All right. So it's not just him that fulfilled it, but when we're in him, it is fulfilled in us as well. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Verse 5. Go ahead and pick up and read a few more verses. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, pause for just a moment, okay? Listen, I was raised Pentecostal, so I don't want anybody here to think that uh, I'm attacking the way you were raised, okay? Attacking the way I was raised. <laughs> All right, let's just clear that up. Not the people that I was raised with, okay? Wonderful people. But I was raised in Pentecostal churches, and to them, being in the flesh was all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going to a movie theater. Going to a grocery store where they sold beer. Wearing your skirt a little too short. Wearing sleeves that expose too much skin. Something a little too low cut. Wearing your hair a certain way. You see where I'm going with it? There was all kinds of stuff that was flesh to them, okay? Yeah. Uh, and, and But listen, what we're talking about is is two laws that are present. The law of sin and death, the law of Moses, and the law of life in Christ, okay? That's what we're talking about, one or the other. So flesh cannot just be summed up as when you go out and think a wrong thought or you go out and do something that doesn't line up. Flesh is more, it's more so being under the law of Moses still. It's still being fleshly minded, okay? Because that, the law of Moses uh, is in contra and your flesh is th thrives because it's empowered under that law. It's empowered under that law. It receives strength under that law. And uh, it's like telling someone they can't do something and they might not have even thought about doing it up until you said you can't. <laughs> then all of a sudden, the fact that you've told them they cannot and they must not and they better not, all of a sudden, something triggers in their mind and they begin to think about doing that. Right, right. You know I'm telling you the yeah, truth because right. it's human nature. Yeah. And so eventually we'll end up doing what we were told not to do by human nature, okay? Why? Right. Because, the, because the law triggers or excites the flesh or, or, or wrong desires, okay? So he said the mind is set on the flesh. The mindset on flesh is death, but the mindset on spirit is life and peace. So it's talking about two different laws there, okay, that we can have our mind set on. And it's in the danger of the mindset of the flesh is that it's not subject, that our flesh doesn't subject itself to the law of God, and it's not even able to do so. That's why last week I was talking about this. I said last Sunday, if you didn't get that message, maybe grab that. Uh, I'm not going to preach to Adam anymore. I'm going to reckon him to be dead. Yes. I'm going to leave him in the grave, okay? Yes. I'm going to quit. We have, we have more faith in the ability to raise Adam from the dead than we do Christ. <laughs> we go around talking all the time about every, every time we stumble or have a wrong desire or anything like that, we say, well, that's just Adam. Raise him back up in me. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I've said it before, too. I'm not going to say it anymore. I'm going to leave Adam dead, okay? Amen. I'm going to reckon him dead. And when I was baptized, when I came, the reason why water baptism is so important, and it is important, it's because it is the reckoning, it is the connection that you, Dwayne Sheriff talked about identification in a CD I listened to that was really good. It's you identifying with the death burial, but what water baptism is you identifying with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, right, right. So if you went down with him, you are then coming up with him as well. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't believe in the doctrine of inclusionism, but I will tell you this, though. All sin was paid for on the cross. Yeah. All sin, past, present, and future of every man, woman, boy, girl, every, everyone, every, I mean Hitler. Let's just throw some names out there that you can connect with, okay? Hitler and different people like that. The sin debt itself was paid for on the cross of Calvary. Yes. Okay, now, when we, are bat when we believe on the Lord Jesus and we're baptized and we identify with his resurrection then that begins to make the impact and the difference in our life because we reckon that old man to be dead and we don't live anymore after that, after the old man's uh, law anymore, okay? We're reckoning that to be dead now. So I believe that, that the debt was paid for all men to be saved, okay? The price was paid. Now, the, now us believing on that sacrifice causes us to be born again. It causes us to be born again. Not all have believed on that sacrifice. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not putting Hitler in hell or heaven just because I used him. I'm just using that because that's one of the most horrific names we can come up with. 
All right, you know what I'm saying? Because we think, well, my sins were paid for, but someone else's sins weren't. That's what we tend to think sometimes. Because we begin to classify what's worse. And so we begin to think that what we do isn't as bad as what he did or, or what someone else is doing. That's a slippery slope. Right. Okay. There's, there's transgressing the law and there's not. Okay. And that was the thing about the law of Moses. If you didn't keep the entire thing, then you were guilty of transgressing the entire thing. Okay. You couldn't just break one part of it and, and say, okay, well, I'm guilty of breaking that part. No, you're guilty of breaking the entire law if you couldn't keep one part of it, okay? And so that's what we're talking about this morning is, is that different mindset. And, um, and I'm going to go somewhere with this. I don't know that I'm going to stay in Romans 8 very long because if I did, we could go through her three verses at a time and spend the entire 30, 45 minutes that we have. But he goes on to talk about, and, and I'll probably deviate from it and come back to it uh, here soon in the next uh, couple of weeks. But he begins to talk in here about not being able to please God if we're operating in the flesh, how we have to please the spirit. But then he goes, says in verse 9, however, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, how many of you have been born again? Yeah. Everyone in this room has been born again. That means the spirit of Christ is in you. Right. He is in you, okay? He lives in you. He dwells in you. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Amen. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus dwells from the dead, rather, dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if the spirit, you, if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, he's telling us right there, how do we mortify the deeds of the flesh? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to preach to Adam anymore. And I'm not saying that every time I act up or misbehave or have a wrong thought, that that's the Adam nature but what it is, though, is the flesh. Right. It is the flesh because the flesh remains contrary to the laws of God, okay? And there are laws. We're not lawless in the new covenant, okay? Right. There are laws, but they're different. There are laws that are, that are empowered from the inside out, not the outside in, right. okay? And, and, the, and in fact, the Holy Spirit, we've talked about this before, is the governor that lives inside of us, making us the governor's mansion. He lives in us. He dwells in us. He governs our life from the inside out. We are, we are a holy people because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Now listen, you need to understand something. You're not holy up until you do something wrong and then you cease to be holy anymore. Okay, you are holy because of the blood of Jesus and the Spirit of God living in you. Now this is one thing about the way that I was raised I disagree with. I've taken a lot of stuff and gleaned from it and grown from it and moved on with that revelation but then there are some things they just didn't have and i didn't have even until a few years ago but holiness is not is not defined by your behavior that's right yeah. holiness is defined by the behavior of jesus christ yes. it's be, it's defined by what he did on the cross that's right. the yeah. holy spirit is living in you and if you and these these verses just told us that if he is living in you he is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, so he can also quicken your mortal body. Right. So the body of flesh that you're struggling with will receive life from the Holy Spirit. It's about you believing, first of all, and then beginning to identify with your new life in Christ and with the life of Christ that's in you. And then it says that we're not, he said, we're not under obligation to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live by the flesh, you must die. But if you live by the Spirit, you're putting to death. Okay, now there it is. There's the key. If you are aware of and living in the Spirit now, and the Spirit is living in you, you are, he didn't say you have once and for all forever put to death. He says you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Right. So we understand that it's the Holy Spirit within us on a daily basis that is giving us the power to not succumb to our flesh. Amen. He is empowering us and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Now, the Adam nature is dead. And every time your flesh misbehaves, that's not the Adam nature being raised back from the dead. Okay. That's just the flesh is what that is. All right. So 
I, I said last week, and I've heard I've heard Mark Shell preach this. I've heard Lynn Howes preach this, and I, I believe this as well. It's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but I believe the reason the Adam nature stays stirred up is because whatever we preach manifests, and we have preached to it for so long and preached that he's raising up, and so he keeps raising up and showing up in our lives. But I believe you're a new creature in Christ, Amen. and I'm going to keep preaching to that person that you are. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to preach to the new creature that you are in Christ, and I guarantee you after some time of you hearing that, and, it, and that hearing turning into faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. After some time of you hearing that and it turning into faith and you believing that, I'm going to see the new nature manifest in you. Right. Yeah. I'm going to see the new nature manifest from you. I'm going to see you doing kingdom things and see you living the kingdom life. And I'm going to know they are believing it. Amen. They are believing it now and they are manifesting it out of their life. Amen. Amen. So he goes on and he talks about sonship in the next few verses. He says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Right. And it's powerful what he gets into right here. And we talked about sonship the last couple of times that I preached. But he says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage or slavery leading to fear again. Now he's directly referencing the law right there is what he's referencing. Okay. Uh, but he said, you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The rest of the chapter gets into some stuff talking about, um, talking about creation, groans, waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. And listen, I believe that not only were we redeemed, I, I, did you guys see the post that Lynn Hiles put on? It was I, um, this week, it blew my mind because it was where I was. It's where, it's the vein that I was studying in all week this week. And he said, he said, um, what we def have defined as an act of God is usually a tragedy. A hurricane, a tsunami, a massive destructive tornado, those have become labeled acts of God. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He said, but how about this as an act of God? In the middle of a storm, in the middle of a typhoon, the only one in the ship who is in rest, Jesus Christ, stands up and speaks and prophesies to the storm. And the, the rest in him prophesies to the storm and the storm rests. He speaks rest into the storm. And what he's talking about, he said, why don't we show the world an act of God like that? Yeah. Instead of telling the world that it's an act of God, like every time the tornadoes, um, every time the tornadoes hit and tear something up, we start preaching that it's because of sin in that place. Now that, you'll get me really ticked off if I talk about that for very long. Because I, I, I actually did hear people talking about how more was judged by God from that tornado that hit it because of some gay parade or something like that that, they, that the city of Moore had hosted. But listen, those children that died in that elementary school, they, they weren't gay, okay? They, they, they were young, small children. It had nothing to do with it. Who was gay in the boat that night out on the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee when they were going across Jesus and the disciples? Who was gay that night? Why did that storm attack them? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be facetious here, but we want to act like every time an act of God hits, God is judging something that we have deemed to be sin or we've deemed to be wrong, when in fact the real act of God is when the, the Christians come in after nature, after uh, creation has acted up. Uh, and I, when I say creation, I'm talking about the world itself, okay, and the earth. Uh, whenever that has acted up and devastated lives, an act of God is us arriving on the scene showing the love of yes. God. Yes. Amen. And sharing yes. the good news with them and feeding them, yes. clothing them, giving them a place to stay. Amen. And just telling them how much God loves them. Not getting up on television, using your airtime to tell yes. them that God is angry with yes. them and he's judging them. Right. Right. Amen. I'm sick of it and I've had it with those preachers that are wasting valuable airtime. Yes preaching judgment and wrath when all of the wrath of God on sin was poured out on the cross. Right. Amen. Yes. Now I will tell you this, that there are consequences to behavior, and I'm not even talking about that this right. morning. Right. But as far as wrath being poured out on sin, it happened 2,000 years right. ago. Yes. Amen. 
what we when we see tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes, we're seeing the earth, creation itself, is 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 acting up and it's groaning and moving and shifting and the and and and, and layer upon layer of earth shifting against itself, causing these things to happen. I don't believe you and I were the only thing redeemed on the cross. I believe that all the creation was redeemed as well. Yeah. I believe that in Genesis, creation fell with us. All of creation fell. And I believe that, there, that some of the violence that we see going on in the world from nature itself is the result of fallen nature, fallen creation, a fallen system, a fallen world. But I believe that it was all redeemed on the cross. What creation is waiting for now is what it gets into in Romans 8 is for some sons and daughters to stand up and prophesy, begin to manifest their sonship. And we're coming into that. We're coming into that now. You can stand up and, and rebuke storms. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not personally telling you what to do, but I have watched my mom stand up. Stand out on the porch and rebuke tornadoes and seeing them turn away from our house on more than one occasion. More than one occasion. When I was growing up, there were folks from all over the neighborhood that would come down and get in our closet. Because they knew that my mom was a prayer warrior. And they knew that she read her Bible. And they knew that she met Jesus in her room every day. <laughs> okay? So we would have folks come down there and get in the closet. Now, she'd pray in tongues and it would spook some of the Baptist folks that were in there at that time. She would pray in tongues and she would tell that tornado, you are not taking my house, you are not taking my family, you are not taking my town. I command you to dissipate, I command you to fall apart, and it did every time. Every time. All right, now I'm, I'm not saying anything about the storms that recently hit. I'm just saying that once you personally are convinced and have the faith and your mindset has shifted to one of belief and you believe you are a son of God, amen, you can speak, you begin to speak and you begin to prophesy That's to right. things, yes. amen, yes. and you call things that are not as though they are, and I believe we're, we're going to begin to see results in the body of Christ, yes. because what's going on here is not just going on on an individual basis, it's a, it's a worldwide shift, it's a worldwide revolution, a grace revolution that is restoring the body of Christ worldwide, not just so that you can get victory over your migraine, okay, now that's part of it. That's, that's part of it. But it's so creation can manifest sons and daughters in the earth. Amen. It's a bigger picture than just you and your migraine and me and my finances. And listen, we have problems. We all have problems. But I have to think in a big picture here. I have to think of what God is doing in the body of Christ, what he's doing in the earth, what he's doing in me. And I have to let all three of them be aligned together. And know that he's doing something in me for sure. And he cares about me. And he cares about every detail of my life. But he also is working on a larger scale. And I want to line up with what he's doing in the earth. Amen? Yes. Amen. Okay, how many of you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. Amen. All right, I believe that guilt, guilt is a relationship killer when it comes to our relationship with God especially. Amen. Guilt is a relationship killer. If you were to lose your temper and spin out of control and throw just a massive fit. Now, I've never done it, but I've heard about folks that have. <laughs> yeah, you know better, right? <laughs> Stacy, be quiet. <laughs> now, you know, there, there's a process that starts to happen there. After you settle down and calm down, you begin to feel sick about what you did. You, guilt begins to overwhelm you and overcome you. And, and guilt is a signal that in our, that in our lives that that our lives rather have been disrupted by sin. Guilt is a signal that our lives have been disrupted by sin. It's a sign that there's a hurt that needs to be healed and that there's a problem there, okay? But listen, I, there's, a, there's an issue with guilt, and I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 2, if you would. I want to talk to you about what guilt and condemnation does. Chapter 3, sorry. Chapter 3. Now I'm going to you guys have heard me preach and preach and re-preach this, so I'm not going to get back into all of it, okay? But I want to start at verse 6, okay? This is after this, well, let's start at verse 5. This is what the serpent is telling Eve, okay? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Now, what, what eyes are, is he talking about? Because Eve wasn't blind. 
Okay, so listen to this. That your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing. So he says knowing. So we know what he's really talking about is your mind. Okay, your eyes will be open and you will know good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. So it's definitely talking about the mind there. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. She gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And look what happened in verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest to me, which with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. So then the Lord goes on and he begins to curse the serpent, the woman, and the man. And he kills an animal, which I have reason to believe it was a lamb. And he takes, but, but anyway, he takes the fig leaves off of them because that's not sufficient. Because blood has to be shed at that moment. So he kills an animal and he clothes them in the skins of an animal to, because something had to die there, okay? And he loved Adam and Eve too much. They had already died one type of death, but he didn't want to take their life as well. So an animal had to die in their place. It's the very first picture of Calvary. Very first, right there. It's the first picture. The lamb, amen, was slain in Adam and Eve's place. And not only did Adam and Eve, not only were they allowed to live, but they're now living the life of the lamb. Amen? amen. They're living the life of the lamb now because the lamb died a substitutionary death for them. So there's, there's an exchange that took place there, okay? But I want you to notice what happened there, okay? As soon as they ate, it said their eyes were open. Really what it's talking about is their mind was open. There was a part of their mind that for the first time became aware. Now get this, okay? Because this is what the Lord spoke to me this morning. All of a sudden, for the first time, man became aware of the vast difference between him and God. Yeah. And it had not been that way up until that point. God created him as a son, clothed him in his glory, told him to take dominion over the earth, and Adam did. Told him, name every living thing, and Adam did. Amen. Told him to begin to reproduce, taught everything he told him to do. So Adam is functioning in his mandates up until this moment. At that very moment, though, guilt and shame immediately steps in because Adam and Eve, for the first time, are aware of the vast difference between them and God. He is so holy. He is so supreme. He is, I, I am not him. They, they, and see, God never meant for man to know the difference between him and God. Wow. He never meant for man to know. He did not mean for us to know the difference between us and him. Because knowing the difference caused Adam and Eve to cower in shame and fear. Amen. They were ashamed of their nakedness. They hid in the trees. They covered themselves. And they hid from God when he began walking through the garden. Okay. Look at all of the things that, it, that a guilty conscience produced. Because that's really what it boils down to. A guilty conscience produced shame, produced guilt, and produced fear. All three right there. And all of them can be summed up in the root word condemnation. Really could be. Okay. So what God did on Calvary, though, was so complete and so powerful, and a lot of people are just afraid to preach it the way that he did. Now, I don't have a large congregation to lose, so I don't care, and I, and I believe you guys are along for the ride anyway, all right? But, but I, I think that what he did on Calvary was so complete that he, but thanks to the blood of Jesus, he purged our conscience to make us able to think that we're like God again. To think that we are guilt-free and shame-free again. Now, a lot of people aren't thinking that way yet, but it's because you haven't been told enough that you can. You haven't had it properly taught to you and preached to you, and I haven't either until recently. So don't feel bad, okay? I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you, we haven't been told until just in the last few years 
a revolution of preachers have risen up and started preaching grace Amen. the way that Paul preached it. Amen. Amen. Yes. And they and they have been ostracized and criticized and made fun of and attacked and people have said have called them crazy grease greasy grace preachers. Now listen to this one. This one is the one that cracks me up. They say, Well, are you preaching grace or are you preaching hyper grace? Well now what's the difference? Okay? Now listen, I was raised in circles where it was okay to have hyper holiness. Okay? Hyper holiness abounded. Everybody went to the extreme on hyper holiness. And look, if I wasn't such a loving person, I'd post this all over Facebook. But I just don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, I want to preach to them. I want to teach to them. I want to help them see the Word of God, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. Right. But but listen, right. it's okay for the church to get swept away in hyper-holiness, tell us where to go and not go, where, what to do and what to not do, and, and, and tell us all of this stuff that we have to do to stay holy and to be holy. The entire church for a hundred years got swept away in hyper-holiness. Yeah. But the grace camp never rose up and called it hyper-holiness. Charisma Magazine never wrote articles and dedicated it to the hyper-holiness movement. <laughs> you see where I'm going? But all of a sudden now, it's quiet in this place. All of a sudden now, when the grace preachers are preaching the way Paul preached, now all of a sudden it's hyper-grace. Okay? And listen, the problem with that is the way Paul preached it, 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 if, 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 it if the grace you're preaching does not come into question, then it's not really real grace anyway. Amen. It's really not because what he did for us on Calvary was so extravagant, so far reaching, so amazing that it, it, it makes you question, is this really it? I mean, it, this is too good to be true. And that's the way you have to think about it before you be the revelation of it begins to grip you. Now, I'm not getting anywhere into my notes this morning, and I got a lot of stuff that I wanted to share. So I'm just got, I got to highlight a couple of things here, but let me tell you what Hebrews 10, 22 says, okay? It says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, which is the water of the word, okay? So your body is along for the ride here, okay? Your body doesn't have to tell you how to live. Your body should just be along for the ride. Amen. Your body should be going wherever your spirit is leading it. Your spirit is governed by the purpose of God, by the God-given mandate that it has. And your body should just be the vehicle that gets in there. My truck doesn't tell me where I'm going to go every day. It, it, it doesn't tell me where I'm going to go. I don't go out and ask my truck what it wants to do and where it wants to go that day. I make up my mind where I want to go, what I want to do, where I need to go, what mandates do I have. Then I start my truck and take my truck where I'm going. Right. Amen. So your body does not have to tell you how to live and where to go every day. You say, well, I got these desires. Yeah, we all have desires. You say, well, I got these cravings. We all have cravings. You say, yeah, but they've been with me since I was a boy. Doesn't that mean God made me that way? No, that's not what it means. It means that you need to tell your body, your, you're not telling me where we're going. Yes. You're not going to define to me who I am or what I am. I'm going to define to you what we are. Yes. Right. Amen? Yes. I'm going to speak purpose into you. You're not going to speak purpose into me. Right. All right, right, I'm preaching good. All right. Yes. I, I, yes. I'm just telling you, okay? My, my, this church is open. I mean, yes. this church is open to anyone that wants to come here. Anyone that wants to come here. Right. Homosexuals, lesbians, I don't care. Send them on in. That's fine. I'll preach the good news to them. And listen, this is going to blow your mind, okay? I'm going to tell them God loves them, and I'm going to tell them this as well. I'm going to tell them they're saved. Yes. Yes. Now, I might have lost some of you right there because some of you might think, well, now, wait a second. They can't be saved and live like that. Really? Really? Are, are you sure about that? We can be saved and we can eat till we become 350 pounds and cause heart disease. We can be saved and we can gossip and talk about everyone we want to talk about. Yes. We can be saved and sit there and surf porn on the internet. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. We can be saved and we can do all kinds of stuff. We can think lustful thoughts and we can even go out to the no-tell motel. As long as nobody finds out about it, we're okay. And we're still saved. But gays and lesbians, they can't come in and be saved until they repent. Now listen, I've got a serious problem with that, okay? And the Lord has had to take me there slowly but surely. I'm not justifying 
anything that they're doing, I'm just saying if we never tell them the good news, right. if we never tell them how much Jesus loves them and the price he paid for them, how will they ever know that there is another option? That's right. That's right. How will they ever know that there is a different choice? Amen. That just because they were born with certain feelings, that doesn't mean that is their purpose. That's right. That yeah. does not mean that is their destiny. Because I, I could get into about five different reasons why each one of us are born with certain proclivities and tendencies in our life. And I could, I could get in there and I could lay it out for you, okay? I don't have time to do it today. But that does not define your identity. That does not define your purpose. You have to overcome those things and you have to put the flesh to death. Amen? Right. Amen. Tell your flesh, you're my vehicle. You're going to go where I tell you to go. You're yes. going to do what I tell you to do. That's Amen? Good. Good. All right, man, that wasn't in anywhere in my notes. Good. So good. Hebrews 10, 22 says... Good. Hebrews 10, 22 says we can draw near to God. Now that's the total opposite of what Adam did. Adam was used to fellowship, but when God approached him, he withdrew. He shrank back in fear from God. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see what fear and condemnation and guilt does? Yep. It makes you hide in fear from the only one who can help you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. From the only one that can help you. Man, I've said some stuff today. Y'all are either going to go home and love me or hate me. Or you go home and wonder if I'm, if I'm right on or not. But listen... <laughs> We have to be able to preach the gospel in a way that it liberates men and women from yeah. guilt and shame. Amen. We have to preach it in a manner where it lifts condemnation off, off of them. Amen. We were not created to thrive in condemnation. Amen. Condemnation is a mindset that imprisons us and holds us down and makes us shrink back, draw back. Those are all words that are in the New Testament, in fact. Talks about a shrinking back, a drawing back, okay? A cowering down, if you will. But we were not created to operate with that type of a mindset. We were created to operate with confidence, boldness, authority, and initiative, amen? We were created to thrive in the environment of God's presence. But if you are shrinking back in fear, you can't be in God's presence, amen? Well, and God knew that. He knew that he never intended for man to be aware in his conscience of the vast difference between him as a creation and God as the creator. Right. He never intended for man to know that. Now I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there and you're probably thinking things in your mind like, well, okay, well, why did he create us then? He had to have known what was going to happen and he most certainly did. But listen, he, ha he has a mandate and a purpose People get so, so, so sideswiped by predestination, and they begin to think about predestination, and they get sideswiped by it, and off track by it, and they end up in a ditch somewhere. But you cannot preach about predestination unless you're going to talk about foreknowledge. Right. Because the Bible says, who he foreknew, he predestined. Now, God knew everything in advance. He didn't predestine anyone for heaven or for hell outside of what he already knew. Everything was, everything, every purpose, every mandate, everything ever released from heaven or done from heaven was based on his foreknowledge. Okay? It was based on his foreknowledge. So he didn't create some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. He didn't create some to live in his presence and some outside of his presence. You see where I'm going with it now? I, I wasn't trying to go off on a bunny trail. I just want you to understand that it's his foreknowledge that we should be talking about. Not, not just the predestination. It's the foreknowledge that actually has preeminence over the predestination. Amen. He never wanted us to live life outside of his presence. Amen. He looked, then, so in Genesis, Adam is shrinking back. The first question in the Old Testament is, Adam, where art thou? Now you fast forward to the New Testament, and I looked yesterday. And when you get in Matthew, the first question in Matthew is, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Wow. Amen. Amen. That's not in, in the other Gospels because the other Gospels include all the accounts of John the Baptist and Elizabeth and Zechariah. But Matthew dives right into the birth of Jesus. And the first question in the New Testament is, where is he that was born king of the Jews? Indicating that when Jesus came, he was everything that the Father was looking for in the earth. He was looking for his image in the earth. And when Jesus came, he saw his image in the earth when he was a baby in swaddling clothes in a manger. He saw his image in the earth again. Now, he didn't publicly announce it until, at, until the Jordan River. 
at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized. He came up out of the water and he told the entire earth that was standing there, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And what he could have said and what he really did say, if, if you preach it right, he could have said, here's the second son. Here's the last Adam. The first Adam took everything off course and stepped outside of my glory and outside of my presence and took on a sin consciousness, an awareness of sin, an awareness of his difference from me that I never intended for him to have. But this is the last Adam. This is my second son, my begotten son. This is the last Adam. I'm well pleased with him and what he has accomplished. And what he knew, and the reason the father could speak past sense is because he knew the lamb was slain from before the foundations of the world. Right. So you might be asking yourself, why would God create us knowing we were going to fall? But I want to ask you, if he knew we were going to fall, he created us anyway because he loved us so much. Yeah. Oh, he right. knew that our creation was going to cost his son his That's own good. life. Good. Good. Amen. And he created us anyway. Okay, he wanted fellowship with you. He created us to fellowship with him. We got a lot of good worship songs that talk about how we were created to worship, and that's fine. We do worship, but you were created to be an image of him in the earth. That's what we were created for, to be an image of him in the earth. And when we are in that position, and we can be now in Christ. Now, I got to wind this up. I got I to gotta lasso all these thoughts in here and bring them to a close this morning, and we'll pick back up on them, okay? But uh, I, I've shared this verse before. Leviticus 17, 11 says that, that he gave us the blood. The blood of atonement was given. It was shed on the altar for the saving of our, or for the atonement of our souls. And our souls are our mind, will, and emotion. Okay, so the blood that he gave us, Leviticus 17 and 11 was prophesying <laughs> Calvary. The blood that Jesus Christ shed was to purge our conscience. To reinstate, to, to recreate, actually, to regenerate. That's why the Bible says that we have been recreated. We've been re, the new man is regenerated. And you break that word down, it's regenerated. Regenerated, okay? So we've been regened in the new covenant to now in the, in the new creation, in the new world, on this side of the, the resurrection of Jesus. We've been regened to have a blameless mental disposition Amen. again. Yes. <laughs> now I'm giving you some stuff to think about. I know that I am. All right. And you might have a hard time swallowing it right now, but you will start believing it. Yes. You will start believing it and you'll start seeing it. And when you do, when your faith aligns with that, you're going to start seeing you do things that you never dreamed possible that you would do. Amen. 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 Going places you never dreamed yourself possible. Amen. Because you're going to stop hiding in the fig leaves. And you're going to have the faith and the boldness to come out and go boldly before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. That's what Hebrew says, amen. That through the blood of Jesus, we can go through that veil of flesh. Now, the veil is gone, in fact. The veil is torn out of the way. We can boldly go before the throne of grace and find help in what? In time of need? Is that what it says? That's what it says. So Adam was in his time of need, but his conscience wouldn't let him go to God for that need to be met. He shrank back and hid in the trees. But now Jesus, the last Adam, the second son, the last Adam, the price that he paid on Calvary was to renew our minds, was to restore our innocence, was to redeem fallen man and put us back in alignment with God, with the Father, with the Creator again. So now we don't have to shrink back in time of need. Amen. Now that's, that's the tying in place right there. Yeah. <laughs> We don't have to hide when we have a need. When we have a weakness, when, we, when, when, when our flesh, when we have let the flesh call the shots for a little while, and we're beginning to now reap some consequences from it, you don't have to run from God. Yeah. Amen? Run to Him. Yeah. Run to Him. Yes. Amen? Yes. He's the only one that can help you in time of need. And because of the blood of Jesus, you don't have to hide from Him anymore. Amen? Amen? <laughs> You can come out of whatever closet you've been in. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> whatever closet you've been in, you can come out. You don't have to hide from him anymore. Amen. Amen. You don't have to hide from him. Go to him in time of need and let him help you. Let him restore you. You say, preacher, are you trying to tell me what to do and what to be and how to live? No, I'm not. I'm trying to tell you that you can go to God. 
without any fear in your heart whatsoever, without any fear of repercussion, without any fear of judgment, you can go to God for help in your time of need, and you can receive your identity from Him. Amen. You can receive your purpose and your destiny from Him. Because you don't need it from me. You don't need to know what I think about you or what I think you should do with your life. You need to know what am I created for. What is my purpose? And you can only get that from him. Amen. And you can come to him naked and not ashamed. That's right. Amen. Amen. Totally not ashamed because of the blood of Jesus. Now stand to your feet. Amen.